So it's my pleasure to welcome to the Aurora Philosophy Institute, uh, Professor Graham Hubbs, uh, from the uh, Chair of the Philosophy Department at the University of Idaho. And he's going to talk about uh, G.E. Anscombe, Gertrude Elizabeth. Margaret. Uh, Margaret Anscombe. Yeah. Uh, who was the late professor of philosophy at the University of Cambridge, uh, associate of Wittgenstein, um, and one of the leading um, woman philosophers of the, the 20th century. Um, Graham. Great. Thanks to all. So um, uh, as, as John indicated in the unrecorded introduction, um, I've been working on the ontology of money for the last handful of years. Uh, my uh, prior... Um, uh, expertise and work was in theories of practical rationality that have grown out of <clears throat> the work of Anscombe in the middle of the 20th century, and in particular her book Intention, which will be the uh, or what we'll, we'll end up focusing on today. Um, oops, it is not letting my slides go. There we go. Okay, so there is uh, here's a picture of Anscombe, a little bit of her biography to get going here. Um, she was born in Limerick, Ireland on March 18th of 1919. And though she was born in Ireland, she was not, um, she was not raised Catholic, uh, but uh, apparently took an interest in Catholicism at a pretty young age in her life. When she um, left Ireland to go to Oxford uh, to study at university at St. Hugh's College, she immediately began taking up studies of Catholicism in, in conjunction with her uh, philosophical studies. <clears throat> and she converted to Catholicism shortly after uh, arriving um, uh, at Oxford. The role of Catholicism in, in her philosophy uh, and in her, in her scholarship is um, something that we'll be touching on over the course of this discussion. Um, I think she was um, admirably careful in works that she was, that were not intended to have any sort of uh, religious influence whatsoever of, uh, of keeping um, her, her Catholic um, uh, beliefs and, and convictions out of the way that she wrote. Um, I think she has a, she's quoted as saying something like, uh, you know, moralizing is bad for thinking or moralizing is bad for philosophy. Um, one of her projects as we'll see going forward here is to figure, find a way to give a grounds for doing moral philosophy before actually engaging in substantive moral philosophy itself. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, she wrote a lot of Catholic philosophy and a lot of stuff that um, I think would be recognizable as the um, a connection between philosophy and theology as well. So it's not as if she had no intellectual life in Catholicism, but um, one can read her work and get the impression that these things were uh, fairly compartmentalized. Uh, after she uh, completed her degree at Oxford, it wasn't long before she went to Cambridge where she met Ludwig Wittgenstein. I'll have a bit to say about Wittgenstein here in just a second. Uh, uh, regarded as, um, uh, you know, depending upon your proclivities, one of, if not the greatest 20th century um, philosopher uh, of the West, um, certainly one of the most influential. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about Anscombe's work with Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein's influence on her as well um, here in due course. She moved back to Oxford in 1946 uh, and then returned to Cambridge again in 1970, which is where she retired. Um, and she retired holding the same chair, holding the same chair that Wittgenstein had held um, uh, you know, before her when she was there. And she uh, died in 2001 on the 5th of January. So let's talk a little bit about Wittgenstein, um, which I think is necessary in order to understand uh, the mode and the approach and, and, and the method that, that uh, Anscombe has in pursuing her topics. Wittgenstein lived from 1889 to 1951. Uh, prior to coming to Cambridge, he was in Vienna in the 1920s where his work exerted quite a bit of influence on the Vienna circle. And he had contact with folks in the Vienna circle, although he himself was not a member of the circle. Uh, when he moved to Cambridge in 1929, he spent the most of the remainder of his life there. Um, he was well known in his day. Uh, when he arrived in Cambridge, uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote to his wife, well, God has arrived. I met him on the 515 train. So uh, imagine uh, Keynes saying that about, about you. Um, it shows that uh, how, how well known he already was in his own day. Um, Wittgenstein left behind two works that are the um, sort of 
cornerstones of what uh, created his legacy going forward and what are um, studied in, in uh, analytic philosophy departments today. The first is the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which exerted influence over the Vienna Circle and on a style of philosophy done at the early part of the 20th century called logical positivism, which I will say a little bit about here uh, in just a second. <clears throat> His other work, is Philosophical Investigations, which was published posthumously, Anscombe was the translator for Philosophical Investigations into English. Um, uh, Anscombe was the only person that Wittgenstein trusted to understand his way of thinking clearly enough to be able to render his text into English and uh, not screw up what he was trying to say. So um, he clearly had a, a great deal of, of trust in her um, as a philosopher uh, to, to make her the, the sole translator uh, of the text. And there is um, uh, a common way of understanding these two texts is that there is a, a break between the investigations and, and, the, and the Tractatus. Um, some Wittgenstein scholars think that there's more continuity between the two of them than, than is the, the common understanding. Um, but I think it'll be useful for our um, discussion to focus maybe not on the Tractatus itself, but the logical positivists who were um, uh, doing a similar style of philosophy and perhaps influenced by the Tractatus and then contrast it with the ordinary language philosophy of the investigation. So we'll, we'll proceed on to that here, again, all setting the table for understanding Anscombe's method and intention. So, <clears throat> The context for the investigations is as uh, we can think of it as a reaction to certain moments in logical positivism. So what was logical positive, positivism all about? <clears throat> uh, the positivists thought that one of philosophy's principal tasks was to explain the logical structure of modern science. And the reason this had come to be one of philosophy's principal tasks is that a lot of stuff that philosophers used to have as uh, their domain of study had been removed from them at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century um, through the emergence of the social sciences, through economics, sociology, and perhaps most profoundly psychology. Um, psychology could now take on questions about the content of perception that uh, prior to the rise of empirical psychology had been the domain of philosophers of mind and epistemologists to say, what are the, what are the contents of the mind like? So philosophers find themselves having less and less stuff to talk about than they had had for centuries before, because more and more uh, areas of human inquiry are being taken over by um, social sciences. And so um, the positivist uh, uh, embraced the following task for philosophy. Um, let's look at science and see if we can understand the way in which uh, the creation of science and the movement of science has a logic to it using the tools of um, symbolic logic that were developing rapidly at the end of the 19th and the 20th century. <clears throat> um, now, an important part of this project uh, is to explain the logical connections between empirical experience and the laws of scientific theory. Um, the whole idea behind empirical science is that our understanding of the laws that, that, that govern the way that the world works will be based on observation and that the, uh, the development of our understanding of the laws will be derived from uh, observations conducted in, um, in experimental settings. So um, figuring out what the connection is between particular uh, empirical observations and general laws that are supposed to have a universality to them that's distinct from the particularity of observing something on any given event that's part of what the project of logical positivism was, was to explain the logic that connects the particulars of experience up to uh, the general laws that are the, the statements of the, of the scientific theory. So this in turn ends up giving philosophy of language a, a place of pride and primacy in the positivist program that then continues on throughout analytic philosophy in the 20th century. Now that might seem surprising at first glance. You might think, uh, well, I thought the positivists were gonna try to figure out like how physics and chemistry and maybe biology have a, a logic to them. That seems like you would wanna study um, rocks and atoms and, and badgers and beavers and then think about laws. Where, do, where does language come into any of this? Well, logical logic 
studies the relation within and between propositions. Um, other kinds of formal study that exist are geometry, which studies the relations um, uh, you know, of the kind of thing that you learn in, in uh, maybe elementary or high school is the, the relations uh, between shapes that have a certain kind of regularity, circles, triangles, or whatever. Um, when we think about the uh, universal uh, rigor and regularity and law likeness of logic, we're not studying um, spatial relations, but rather we're studying relations of inference and entailment from one proposition over to another. So if science has a logic, then it is because of the logical relations that hold between specifically scientific propositions. And so that becomes the, the um, locus of inquiry. Um, when we're talking then about studying the connection between experience and theory, when put through the lens of philosophy of language, what this becomes then is a, is a uh, study of the relationship between observation sentences, sentences that get their meaning as the result of being conducted in an observational se uh, setting, and theoretical sentences, sentences that have um, universal quantification in them, um, all, all uh, heavy objects fall to the ground or something like that. A statement that is uh, intended to cover generally uh, phenomena that occur in the world. So there are uh, two important tenets here that I wanna uh, note before we move on to Wittgenstein's critique of logical positivism. One is that the positivists thought that most metaphysics is garbage, um, that a lot of what has paraded as philosophy um, into the 20th century is just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, I think the uh, British uh, Hegelianism was live at the end of the 20th century, and I think they had it out for the Hegelians um, as well. Um, uh, science can do away without, uh, can, science doesn't need um, um, armchair metaphysical speculation and uh, a philosophy should have no part in engaging in such an activity. <clears throat> and that lots of ordinary language is meaningless. Um, the, the strictest forms of logical positivism um, uh, took uh, sentence, observation sentences whose uh, verific verification conditions were untrue just to be as meaningless as talking about what Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny does. So um, it creates a sort of austere picture of what legitimate, good, potentially truth-bearing language is that's suitable for doing science. And everything else is just a bunch of like uh, nonsense that the hoi polloi engage in. Okay, so um, I think the way to understand uh, Wittgenstein's attitude in the investigations and this turn to ordinary language philosophy is to accept the starting point that when we do philosophy, we can't get beyond language. Um, and as much as we're talking about inference, entailment, and logic, we're talking about the relationship between sentences. So uh, that part of the picture he wants to embrace, and we'll see this attitude come up in Anscombe when we return to her. Um, again, this is why we can't get away from language because philosophy is about argument, and it's about giving and asking for reasons, which are linguistic phenomena. <clears throat> so this attitude that most metaphysics is garbage continues on through um, the, the philosophical investigations. Um, uh, he shares this attitude with the positivist, I think. Um, however, he disagrees with the artificial picture of language that was advanced by logical positivism. Uh, he thinks, in fact, most ordinary language use is meaningful. And um, what that leads us to do whenever we're engaging in a philosophical enterprise that may have been conducted by trying to do metaphysics in the vein of, of, of Descartes or Leibniz back in the, in the high modern period, is instead to think about the way that we're talking about what's going on and to focus on our use of propositions in order to articulate whatever the domain is, be it uh, ethics, uh, epistemology, metaphysics, and start by asking ourselves, what do we mean when we say, and then fill in the blank of whatever the key concept or key proposition is that's under, under analysis. With all of that as set up for Wittgenstein, let's turn then to intention. Um, here is the list of quotes that you will see on the back of the current Harvard University Press uh, text. Um, you will see that they're uh, glowing about the influence and importance of the book on the subject of intention and action theory in the 20th century. Uh, Brandom's quote, I think, is apt. Anscombe's classic work is the font from which all subsequent philosophical thought about agency flows. Um, so 
I, I include this for those who are unfamiliar with her or with this text as uh, um, uh, some evidence about its importance in um, 20th century philosophy going on. Here is how intention starts. So um, uh, I, I should have paused to, for dramatic effect here. Um, you, so you, you, you read on the back of the book that there's this, this groundbreaking work for 20th century philosophy. You open it up and you're expecting uh, the depths of profundity and to ready to, to have your mind open to new ways of thinking about philosophy. And you encounter this. Um, here's how Anscombe starts. Very often when a man says, I am going to do such and such, we should say that this was an expression of intention. We also sometimes speak of an action as intentional. And we may also ask what intention, uh, with what intention the thing was done. In each case, we employ a concept of intention. Now, if we set about to describe this concept and, and took only one of these three kinds of statement as containing the whole topic, we might very likely say things about what intention means that it would be false to say in other cases. I invite you to read along as I chat. Um, uh, I certainly was surprised the first time I opened this up to find somebody chatting away about the various ways in which a term may or may not be used, all of which sound extremely commonsensical to discover that this is something that is regarded as a, a high mark in turning um, uh, philosophy um, into new areas and thinking about agency and, and intention. Um, so <clears throat> we will see as we encounter both some more quotes from her and the, the mode by which she proceeds, this um, way of doing philosophy, um, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to explain some of the Wittgenstein heading into this. She gets this way of doing philosophy, I think, directly from Wittgenstein and thinking that, you know, I want to, I want to take on uh, a topic like what is the nature of intention that seems like a deeply metaphysical topic but the way we're going to do it is we're going to look at the way that people talk about intentions the kinds of inferences they make using the concept of intention see where things are messy and then use philosophy to try to clear up the mess in different kinds of uses of the term um, she says where we are tempted to speak of different senses of a word which is clearly not equivocal we may infer that we are in fact pretty much in the dark about the character of the concept which it represents, which gives you a task for philosophy. There is, however, nothing wrong with taking the topic piecemeal. I shall therefore begin my inquiry by considering expressions of intention. Okay, let's go back to that uh, opening quote that um, <clears throat> I put all of it before your eyes and break it down with a little bit more care to see what the project of the, of the text is gonna be. She says, very often when a man says, I'm going to do such and such, we should say that this was an expression of intention. We also sometimes speak of an action as intention null. And we may also ask with what intention the thing was done. So these are the three different senses of intention and its cognates that she thinks are clearly distinct from one another, but it would obviously be a mistake to say they're just three totally unrelated senses. They, they must have something to do with one another. We can intuitively see that. Um, so let's take each piecemeal and then see what they end up having to do with one another. The first kind of intention, I am going to do such and such, is, it, is what she calls an intention for the future. And it sounds like what it's describing is a current mental state. So if I say, uh, I intend to go to dinner, after I have the, uh, I am going to go to dinner after this talk is over with, that states an intention. It seems quite natural to say that somewhere up here, I've got something like a plan that is going to kick in as soon as the talk's over with and I'll go out to dinner. So um, this use of intentional characterizes, it would seem, a current mental state. Oh, this is an even better example. I intend to visit Toronto when travel becomes feasible. Um, uh, it would have been nice to be around for John's birthday yesterday, but we couldn't. I couldn't make it. So um, what could the intention here be besides some psychological state of mind? Seems like the only candidate for what an intention is. But note the way that intentional occurs in the second phrase, speak of an action as intention. We're not talking about a mental state now, but rather we're characterizing a, a kind of event. Um, here's a contrast. Imagine that I slip and knock you over and then think about that in contrast with me intentionally pushing you over. One of these seems to be an intentional action, namely the one in which you know, I have some sort of goal in knocking you over and then take the means and I succeed in doing so. 
um, if I slip and knock you over, um, I, there, an event has taken place, my body has crashed into yours and you've fallen over, but we wouldn't characterize that event, uh, that event as an intentional action. The point here is that intention is acting as an adjective to characterize a kind of action we're not talking directly about a psychological state. And finally, when we say, when we talk about an intention with which um, something is done, we're talking about a kind of reason. So if someone saw me walking up to my office today and said, why are you going up to your office right now? The semester is over with. I might have told them because I want to use the computer in my office for a talk on Anscom I'm giving this afternoon. <clears throat> what I have said here could be described as my intention. My intention is to go up to my office to be able to give the talk. It gives the reason, it answers the question of uh, the why that they've asked me about why I'm headed up to the office. And it does so by stating the, the goal or uh, the Greek term, the telos of my action. All right, let's step back. Why I care about any of this stuff. Oh, well, that was supposed to be uh, the, the bit on the bottom. Imagine that you don't see until I get to the bottom here. Um, well, here's why uh, uh, Anscombe uh, immediately took this up as a topic in the 50s. Um, and at this time, she was at Oxford. Oops, I've lost the ability to do this. <clears throat> Harry S. Truman, who ordered the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, was invited to Oxford in 1956 to receive an honorary degree. And Anscombe and some of her colleagues were furious about this invitation. As far as she was concerned, Truman was a mass murderer for dropping these atomic bombs. Here is a spot where her Catholic background matters for the way that she thought about Truman's action. And her opposition to Truman is driven by her embrace of the Catholic doctrine um, of the of double effect. So what's that? So the doc, if, here's a way of demonstrating the doctrine of double effect. If Truman had done something, intentionally done something that was morally permissible, say send troops into Japan, Anscombe has papers on just war that argues that as acts of self-defense, sometimes going to war against an aggressor is a justifiable thing to do. If you're a pacifist, then you're going to think none of this is true, but um, we're operating here from Anscombe's perspective within the Catholic framework. So some wars are justified. Um, and if you engage in an act of just warfare, but then do something predictable, uh, that is predictable, but is impermissible, like innocent civilians, civilians end up getting killed when you um, invade, the action might be permissible. So according to the doctrine of double effect, if Truman had um, uh, conducted an act that was um, uh, morally permissible as a sort of act of self-defense that predictably had harmful consequences, but was not the goal of the action, and then those consequences took place, um, depending upon the circumstances and more than we're gonna get into in this talk, it's possible that Truman's act would have been morally justified. And what Anscombe sees and what Truman actually did was nothing like that. Anscombe thought that's not what Truman did. He intentionally killed tens of thousands of innocent civilians and that by definition is murder. <clears throat> now this, in presenting this as the context in which Anscombe starts thinking really hard about what makes an intention an intention, um, it's worth mentioning what is, I think, regarded as her second most famous work. <clears throat> um, ah, uh, what, is, what, what about the argument that Truman saved millions by killing these thousands? Sorry, the setup for that was to imagine someone saying, well, Truman had to do it in order to, in order to save the lives of millions more. Um, and with this, we will turn to her essay, Modern Moral Philosophy. Um, which I will, uh, uh, this is worth reading, reading out the, the beginning as well um, to get a flavor of what the essay is all about and um, how it sets the stage for the project of intention. This essay came out uh, uh, while Anscombe was writing intention and a few years before intention was, was published. She says, I will begin by stating three theses which I present in this paper. The first is that it is not profitable for us at present to do moral philosophy. That should be laid aside at any rate until we have an adequate philosophy of psychology in which we are conspicu conspicuously lacking. So she's effectively saying to all of her Oxford colleagues who are moral philosophers, what y'all are doing is a waste of time. Stop, um, uh, do something else with your time. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you what else to do with your time. Here's her second claim that she defends. The second is that the concept of obligation and duty, moral obligation and moral duty, that is to say, and what it is morally right and wrong and of the moral sense of ought, ought to be jettisoned if psychologically possible. 
because they are survivals or derivatives from survivals of an earlier conception of ethics, which no longer generally survives and are only harmful without it. <clears throat> so here she says, uh, if you're gonna keep going ahead and doing moral philosophy, well, at very least stop using the word moral. And don't think that anyone has any idea when people, when you say that you have a moral obligation or you morally ought to do something, this is where some of that uh, talk can be nonsense attitude going back to the positivist comes from. She thought such talk was, was, was nonsense. And so that her uh, Oxford colleagues should stop talking that way. And again, get back on the, the first project. Her third thesis is that differences between all the well-known English writers on moral philosophy from Sidgwick to the present day are of little importance. So uh, that, that they, they can all be lumped together from Sidgwick into the middle of the 19th century as basically having one kind of, uh, of approach to moral philosophy. Um, so these are, these are um, uh, 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 grand and ambitious claims, we'll put it that way. Um, okay, let's take these in reverse because they'll set up the project of intention, which we'll return to here in just a second. So the first is that most English uh, language moral philosophy since Sidgwick is basically the same. Anscombe coined a term for what she thought united all of these different kinds of moral philosophy, and that term is consequentialism. Um, these views don't have the resources, the, the consequentialist views do, to express the doctrine of double effect and so can't express why it was wrong for Truman to order the bombings. This is how thinking about what unites British philosophy since, um, since Sidgwick uh, comes together in her thinking in the context of Truman is that they simply lack the resources to articulate the doctrine of double effect, which is what you need if she thinks you want to be able to say what's um, particularly morally objectionable about Truman's activity. Um, <clears throat> as an aside here, um, she invents the term consequentialism in this essay, and then it goes on to announce the project of virtue ethics um, which I'll say more about as we go along in the talk, um, which are two of the three um, uh, fields of ethics. If you ever take an intro to ethics class or take an applied ethics class or teach one of these classes, um, students will be introduced to the idea that there are three branches of moral philosophy or three sorts of ethics. Consequentialism, which Anscombe invents the name for in this paper, Virtue ethics, which she and some of her colleagues at the time more or less invent, and again, uh, this paper is incredibly influ influential for that for the birth of that. Um, and we'll have an argument against deontology, which is a law-based Kantian sort of ethics here in a second. So in this tiny little paper, um, she lays out the material that will become the standard stuff at the beginning of ethics textbooks for decades to come uh, in English philosophy. It's, it's kind of remarkable how powerful uh, this, this one little paper is for what it ends up doing. <clears throat> okay, so on then to deontology and Anscombe's claim that uh, moral philosophers need to stop talking about the moral sense of ought. <clears throat> Her argument for this is pretty straightforward and it's one that one actually can find all the way back at Schopenhauer. Um, so she's not the, the originator of this argument, but that um, uh, terms, like if you're thinking about morality as a system of laws, Laws only make sense if there is a law giver. The idea of a, of a kind of prescriptive law doesn't make sense out of the context of someone delivering that law. And she argues when the, the basis for ethics was a, 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 the conception of a Judeo-Christian God, then it made all the sense in the world to talk about moral laws because God gave the laws and then you followed them. But she knows that her contemporary uh, um, uh, fellow philosophers at Oxford are by and large uh, secular and, and perhaps even atheist. And so they have no place or right to be talking about moral laws when they don't believe in the moral lawgiver that's necessary for there to be such laws. This is an interesting spot in her philosophy. If you're reading this in a vacuum, she never lets on that she herself is Catholic and believes in this God. Instead, it, it sounds like a, an almost sort of Nietzschean, under, and Nietzsche makes a similar argument too, which again, I think stems to Schopenhauer, just undermining the entire project of ethics because it doesn't conceptually make sense anymore once uh, in Nietzsche's words, God is dead. So that's her, her bit about why moral philosophers should stop talking about the moral sense of thought. Um, what we need to be doing instead, she thinks, is the philosophy of psychology. And what she means by that, I think is presented in intention. So let's review the project of intention here to see, just to, to reorient ourselves about what, what she's gonna try to do here towards, I think, the creation of this moral psychology, what she thinks is necessary before we bother doing any more ethics. 
<clears throat> here are the three kinds of ways in which the term intention is used in the three different categories we've got. A current state of mental event, a current mental event, event, a species of event, a current mental state, a species of event, and a kind of reason. So her strategy in analyzing these different uses, um, which she announced in the, in the first paragraph, but I didn't read it all the way out, is to see if one of these three ideas, one of these three senses of intention is prior to the rest and explains the rest. Because if we, if we wanna understand what intentions are such that they're relevant for the analysis, say, of a, of a moral act or an immoral act such as Truman's, um, maybe the thing to do then is to see if one of the senses uh, in these three different statements is, is explanatorily or logically or conceptually prior and does the work of explaining what the other ones mean. If so, then that'll give us some insight into what we're talking about when we talk about intention. Anscombe thinks that most of her contemporaries are gonna start with one and think about intentions primarily as some kind of psychological state. Um, so, and here's, here's the reason, here's a, a quote that uh, indicates uh, why um, uh, she thinks that her uh, contemporaries will, will start here. I realize that I am already uh, running a touch behind on time. So I am, no, I'm gonna read it. It, it matters for the project, sorry. I, I didn't have that many slides, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, a man can form an intention, which he then does nothing to carry out, either because he is prevented or because he changes his mind. But the intention itself can be complete, although it remains a purely interior thing. What she's doing here is explaining the attraction to thinking that number one, the idea that intentions are psychological states is the right starting place for explaining all the other uses of intention. This conspires to make us think that if we want to know a man's intention, it is into the contents of his mind and only into these that we must inquire. And hence, that if we wish to understand what intention is, we must be investigating something whose existence is purely in the sphere of mind. And that although intention issues and actions, and the way this happens also is pre presents interesting questions. So what physically takes place, what a man actually does is the very last thing we need to consider in our inquiry. I wouldn't have spent this much time setting it up this way if it weren't the case that Anscombe says exactly the opposite. Whereas I want to say it is the first. What is the first sense of intention to focus on or the first way of thinking about intention to understand what an intention is? Anscombe is saying here that her method will be, do not start by thinking about psychological states. Start by thinking about what intentional action is and see if by understanding the nature of intentional action, we can uncover what we mean when we talk about intention as a psychological state. So it's an inversion of what the expected mode of, expl of explanation would be. Instead of starting in the head and thinking about what the body does in order to explain what intentions are, those things in the head, Let's start and look at what people do and see if that somehow reveals what is going on in the head when we talk about intention. This um, I, I call her, uh, trying to move my, my zoom around, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's a critique and argument against psychologism um, is, is the way that we can think about this. So here, if we wanted to, uh, um, the, the, the view that intentions have to first and foremost be something in the head, and then we'll explain everything else um, after that. Label that we'll call that view psychologism. And so we can think of Anscombe as attacking psychologism. So here is her, uh, her, her way, a, a development of an example that she gives in the text for understanding why um, psychologism might be wrong. So let's start with this guy who's pumping over here and we'll call him Pumper A. So what's this guy doing? He's, you, it's a still photo, you can't see him, um, he, but he's moving his arms up and down. And when he moves his arms up and down, he operates the pump. And as he operates the pump, he replenishes the house water supply. Imagine that that trough has got a pipe that then goes to the house water supply. Um, but he doesn't like the people who are inside the house and he's put some poison in there. And so he's gonna deliberately empoison the, the inhabitants. Um, these are four different descriptions of what the guy is doing. Moving his arms up and down, pumping the water, replenishing the house water supply and uh, trying to poison the in inhabitants. So uh, contrast this in the case, with this case with where one to three are still the same. You got a guy moving a lever up and down, water's going in the, in the house water supply and it's got poison in it, but he doesn't know it's there. And so he poisons the inhabitants uh, accidentally. Do pumper A and pumper B do the same thing? Again, in case one, we've got 
inhabitants being poisoned, case two, they are, but Pumper B has no idea that that's what he's doing. We can imagine to flesh out the example, he feels shame and horror when he discovers that that's what he was up to. All right, are these two guys doing the same thing? From a legal perspective, almost certainly not, right? There's a kind of uh, um, uh, a freedom from culpability that the ignorance of, um, uh, of the situation will give to uh, plausibly to, to the guy in the second situation. Um, maybe he's being negligent because he should know that poison is nearby, but whatever he's doing from a legal standpoint, he's not doing the same thing as the first guy who has deliberately set out um, a, a plan to kill some folks and then is, is employing the plan. So it seems like legally, it's very unlikely that in most um, familiar legal systems that these two cases would be treated the same. Morally, again, almost certainly not. In one case, we've got somebody who wants to kill some people, has set about a plan to killing them and is taking the steps to, to bring it about. In the other case, we've got somebody who uh, intends no harm, thinks that they're doing um, doing good and you know, unbeknownst to them if there's, or causing the death of, of many. <clears throat> so um, if, we, if we answer the question, are these guys doing the same thing from a legal or moral perspective and just start with what we're intuitively inclined to say, it's gonna, I, I think that most of our intuitions will tend towards saying these are two different cases. But metaphysically, it's not so clear, right? It depends on what we mean by doing. And um, if we think that human action, for whatever reason, stops at the arms, well, they're moving their arms in exactly the same way. So maybe there is a sense in which they are doing exactly the same thing. But then again, maybe they're not because the, the, what underwrites the legal and moral understanding is itself a metaphysical matter. We got some philosophy to do here in order to sort out how to think through um, the ontology of, uh, of action and the metaphysics of what's going on um, in order to answer the moral and, and legal questions. And I'll say here, since I, I flagged uh, uh, Wittgenstein and the, uh, as the, the later Wittgenstein along with the positives, positivists as uh, great enemies of metaphysics, one way that Anscombe has been um, understood uh, moving forward in the, in the 20th century is um, using this ordinary language philosophy and turning it to topics like intention to find a new way of doing uh, metaphysics, um, perhaps a, a pragmatist mode um, of, of engaging in metaphysics that doesn't involve um, methodologically the kind of gross speculation that is characteristic of the philosophical tradition, um, but uses the way we talk as a way of understanding distinctions that um, we, could, we can call metaphysical and not have to be uh, perhaps ashamed of. Okay, um, let's think uh, some more about these, uh, these pumpers and differences that might make a difference as to how we describe what they're doing. <clears throat> and let's think about difference, the psychological and epistemic differences between the two. Pumper A wants to poison the inhabitants and he knows he is doing so, and Pumper B doesn't want to poison the inhabitants and does not know he is doing so. So um, the psychologistic hypothesis um, that I want to advance is that this is a difference in intention between the two, and it is primarily a causal difference. So when we're describing the difference between the pumpers, what we're describing is a difference of what's going on in their minds, which again is the view that Anscombe wants to challenge. And that this thing that differs in their minds is a thing that has causal efficacy. Um, it leads our bodies to do certain things. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the phrase for this that one finds in the literature sometimes is that intentions are a spring for action. Um, uh, so what is different then and what matters for the legal and moral difference is the cause, the spring for action in the mind that sets the body in motion once the intention has been formed and it is time to execute it. Okay, so that's the target view. Uh, I've presented that as uh, the, the psychologistic view that she wants to argue against. So how do we um, argue against this? Um, this, the, what comes next is me developing a line of thought that one can find an intention. It draws on intention, but it's not exactly the way that Anscombe uh, puts it. Um, uh, so I think the first step that we can take if we want to challenge what might seem like a very commonsensical picture for thinking about what intentions are, is to do what I call the how many intentions argument. Um, now Anscombe doesn't ask the how many intentions question, but she does ask how many actions this guy is performing. Is it one action? Um, you know, there's, there's just one body moving and one series of events that flow through time. 
or is it four? We described him in four different ways, moving his arms, moving the pump, replenishing the house water supply and poisoning. Uh, does that mean that there are four actions here and not one? Well, if it seems like there's four, it seems like there's probably an infinite number of things that he's doing. He's moving it, he's intentionally moving it this far, and then he's intentionally moving it this far, and he's intentionally moving it this far. This can go on for, for infinity. So maybe he's not performing one or four, but he's performing an infinite number. Or maybe an infinity is too large, but maybe there's just a very, very large number of things that he's doing as he's moving, moving the pump. Her answer is basically that this is a miss, um, that this, this, this question misformulates the way to think about the issue. Um, <clears throat> what she says in response to this is that what we're really asking about are the descriptions that apply to what the man is doing and that all action is action under a description. And the um, power of this idea and this, this phrase I think comes when you compare it to asking about if there's a room, how many cheetahs or how many chairs there are. Um, natural kinds like cheetahs and artifacts like chairs come in well-packaged entities that are um, easily individuated from one another so that we can count whether there's two cheetahs in the room or four chairs in the room. By saying that all actions or actions are under a description, she's saying things that unfold through time, as opposed to concrete particulars like cheetahs or chairs, just aren't countable the same way that we count cheetahs and chairs. That when we ask the question, how many actions are there here? We're importing a sort of question that makes sense when we're talking about concrete particulars to a temporal phenomena where it just doesn't uh, readily make sense. And that the key to understanding what makes action action is that it is the descriptions that we bring the actions under but that the, the, this mode of bringing um, going on under descriptions then doesn't divide them up in any necessary way. There's varieties of ways in which we can uh, carve up the temporal space in which action takes place. I think that there's a lesson there for thinking about um, if we wanted to ask the same question about intentions, um, if we wanted, if, uh, if um, in order to, to probe the psychologistic um, view. Are there, does this guy have one intentions? Does he have four, an infinite number, a very large number? Well, it clearly can't be that he's got an infinite number of intentions because brains and minds are finite. Um, so if it's not an infinite number of intentions that this guy has got, then there must be at least in principle some way to count the number of intentions that the pumper has, <clears throat> both in the example and in general. There must be some procedure that we could follow to get it uh, inside his head and count the number that are there if there aren't an infinite number. But what are the individuation conditions of the intentions? What would we be looking for uh, even metaphorically when we get in his mind in the way that if you walk in a room and you're asked to count the chairs, you know exactly what to look for and one, where one chair stops and where another one begins. Skeptical gambit here is that any answer to this question, how do we individuate intentions, quasi-psychological items from one another, will be either arbitrary or question begging or otherwise problematic that the thought about trying to count the intentions in a person's mind when they perform an action leads to such confusion that we ought to see if there's another way of thinking about what intentions are rather than imagining them to be uh, individual, individual and countable items in a person's mind. All right, well, what else could we possibly do? Well, what would be the alternative? We stop thinking about intentions as primarily psychological items. How else should we think about them? Well, here's some options. You could be an eliminativist. Uh, the behaviorists were eliminativist and there are some uh, modern philosophers of mind um, who are inspired by uh, cognitive science to be eliminativist about intentions, <clears throat> which is just to say, I'm just going to throw intention as a category out of my scientific theory. I don't believe there are such things as intentions. The behaviorist said we shouldn't talk about them because you can't see them, basically. Modern cognitive scientists are like, man, when you look at what the brain works, it sure doesn't look at all like that anything that resembles what an intention in folk psychology is. So um, this is a skeptical conclusion. There just are no intentions. <clears throat> this is, uh, I think, a similar kind of response that Hume um, has, uh, the, the, a similar kind of move that Hume makes about causation, which is to eliminate talking about causes as uh, um, uh, the, the necessary um, phenomena that they're purported to be in science. And many people respond to Hume, I think, correctly by saying, well, good luck with that. That's not gonna be of much use for making sense about how we do end up thinking about and talking about the world just to like banish all talk of causation. 
Uh, and Hume himself, I think, is much more pragmatist than you might be led to believe by looking at the arguments against causation. So Hume might be like, yeah, well, good luck with that. I'm going to be a pragmatist along with you too. But um, I think that this is a, um, a kind of uh, a hopeless um, way of proceeding. And uh, as I think we'll see, it would require broad skepticism about practical reasoning to try to do away with thinking about um, uh, uh, the intentions at all. And that that's uh, a kind of skepticism that no one can live with. Another alternative is to be either a post or a neo-Cartesian dualist. Now I, I put post or neo-Cartesian here because I think that to many, it might be surprising to see how much of contemporary psychology, which prides itself on being materialist and prides itself on not accepting the Cartesian divide between two kinds of substances, uh, raised cogitans and raised extensa, is itself Cartesian in the way that it explains how things uh, go on in the world. Even if it's metaphysics are monistically physicalistic. So there's only one kind of substance, there's just material, that's it, I think most modern psychologists would say. The dualistic structure of Cartesianism is preserved anyway in the way that the mechanistic way in which action is explained. There are sensory inputs and then the computer mind does something and then it spits out an output. But that output then is like a command or an instruction for the body to go move around. That input, Com compute output process, the computer in the middle has been, from an explanatory perspective, dualistically separated off of the body that is taking the sense information in and then commanding the nerves to move about. So even if you think there are no souls, that the, that the, the body and the mind and the soul and the spirit, it's all just matter and atoms, um, you can still, from an explanatory uh, position, be a dualist if you think that that's the way to explain how action works. And that is in a way, uh, one of the key things that Anscombe seems to be, wants to be repudiating here. Um, so the other alternative is to, to get back to explaining the explanatory order of intention. Here are the three senses of intention again. <clears throat> and what Anscombe is gonna do in thinking about action in order to explain how the mind works rather than the other way around is to start with two and three, but really three in um, explaining how to think about intention, which is to think of intention first and foremost, foremost as a distinctive kind of reason. And here we get the last of, uh, of Anscombe's heroes who is uh, Aristotle. Um, and she gets her Aristotle through her Catholic upbringing in the, in the Thomist tradition. But uh, um, one of the things that Anscombe I think is responsible for, for the second half of the 20th century in English speaking philosophy is making all kinds of aspects of Aristotle's um, psychology and epistemology, and then in turn his ethics, uh, the centerpiece of philosophical discussion in a way that they had, uh, at least in the English speaking philosophy, become a little bit lost um, in the wake of utilitarianism. Okay, so what does it mean to take an Aristotelian approach to action, an Aristotelian approach to intention as an alternative to the psychologistic approach? This where we start then is to start with practical reasoning and think about what practical reasoning is. Okay, so what is the goal of any bit of practical reasoning? According to Aristotle, it is getting or doing or bringing about what we think is good. Now don't get hung up here on, he's not saying that we all always pursue what we believe is the best thing. He knows that we do things sometimes that act against our um, what, what we believe to, to be best. I um, mean, he certainly doesn't think that we're all moral saints and we all know what the good is and we're all pursuing it. He thinks a lot of bad stuff happens too. The idea is just when you're doing something, you're doing it because you think some benefit is gonna come from what you have done. Any kind of action that takes place is done in order for some benefit to come about. Often that benefit to you, maybe not to anyone else, but like something, you, you, it's not worth spending your time doing anything if nothing good is gonna come of it. That's kind of the, the, the basic idea here. Don't hear that in a moralistic uh, key. All right, well, how does such reasoning go? Anscombe points out that this is Aristotle's own example for what practical reasoning looks like. Dry food suits any human. She remarks it's a rather strange diet that they had back then. Um, such and such food is dry. So I've got the general thought that dry food is good and then I see some food and I'm like, oh, there's some dry food. Now, then I note that I am a human. Uh, so this dry food and me, we're gonna, we're gonna hook up in a way that, that could, be, could be good. Um, and this, oh, sorry, the such and such food is dry is that I know that what categories of, 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 of foods fall under the broad genus of dry food. And now I see one of these kinds of food in front of me. 
Now, Aristotle draws the conclusion and says, this food suits me. And he, he um, uh, Anska makes a big deal out of the fact that in his own writing, he makes that out to be the conclusion of the practical reasoning. But it, that can't be all that's going on there. Because if you just concluded this food suits me, you might sit inert and not do anything towards it. And so she points out that there are ways, other ways in which Aristotle talks about practical reasoning where it's pretty clear that what it means to bring the reasoning to a conclusion is to actually reach out, grab the food and start eating it. Um, to make the motions towards realizing the goodness that could be had from consuming this food that's good for the kind of being that I am. So note that the conclusion of this reasoning is an action itself. It's not just a mental state. It's actually doing something to bring about the good that the reasoning has determined would be good to bring about. What the point of the reasoning is not to figure out what would be a great mental state to get into. The point of the reasoning is to figure out what is worth doing in the world. So the reasoning itself, Aristotle is suggesting, and Anscombe thinks is the deep insight here, the reasoning itself is incomplete. If it just stops with a mental state, you haven't gotten to the end of what the point of the reasoning was, which was to actually do something in the world. <clears throat> This, um, she reads Aristotle as thinking, is a key difference between uh, practical reasoning on the one hand and scientific or theoretical reasoning on the, on the latter. Scientific and theoretical reasoning aims at belief. Its, its goal is to understand what is true in the world and the conclusion is a psychological state, namely a belief that you then carry around with you. Practical reasoning on the other hand aims at the good and it doesn't end in a psychological state, it ends in actually doing something. So for practical reasoning then, uh, any, oh, sorry, so that's what practical reasoning is. A practical reason is just a step in the chain of reasoning that will lead to action. <clears throat> okay, so Anscombe's gloss on what Aristotle was talking about here, he, she, she says that his notion of practical reasoning reveals the order that there is in the chaos of human action. Um, the order in question of action is teleological. Humans do stuff when they do stuff, not accidentally because they trip or the wind blows them over or they sneeze, maybe when they sneeze, but definitely not when the wind blows them over, or they trip. Humans do stuff. They perform actions in order to achieve goals. That's why we do stuff. So the order, the logic of action is teleological. It is goal-directed. She does not think that Aristotle thinks, and she is definitely not claiming that that means that all action is preceded with explicit act of reasoning. Clearly not. Most of what we do in our life, we don't do by like stopping and performing a practical deduction and then going out and doing something. We just act most of the time. But if we do so and our action is intentional, this logic of goal directedness will be unpleasant, it will be implicit and present in the action itself. <clears throat> and that means that in the normal run of things, a person can say why they are doing what they are doing. Now, if you want to talk about in the um, in the Q and A, what to say about um, subconscious or non-conscious or unconscious motives and intentions. We can talk about it. I think Anscombe's view is perfectly compatible with the, the view that, you know, maybe begins with Freud, that a lot of the stuff we do, we don't know why we're doing it. Um, that fact does not need to be in tension with the kind of logic that it, uh, Anscombe is meaning to, to, to um, uh, describe here. We'll come back to that in Q&A if that interests folks. Um, I want to proceed on for now. Um, so Anscombe thinks that in order to understand what an intention is, we don't start with psychology, but rather we start with logic. And the logic that we start with is not the logic of the deductive syllogism of theoretical reasoning, but rather practical logic, which is the order in which all action proceeds. And action proceeds teleologically as a series of means towards and ends. So when we call an action intentional, what we are saying is that the action belongs to this structure of a means to an ends, that's what makes action action is that it has this logical structure of the steps being steps that reasonably are drawing the person towards the goal that they're pursuing. And if we wanna understand what intention is then, then we must first understand what intentional action is, that this is the proper order of explanation to start with practical reasoning and practical logic, and then work back to an understanding about what might go on in the mind. All right. Let's start tying these threads together, wrap this up and get to Q&A. So how does this all pertain to what in her personal life was motivating her to think hard about this stuff at the time, which was Truman being uh, potentially awarded the, um, the I, I think he did get it after all, but the, the honorary doctorate at, at Oxford. 
<clears throat> All right, again, doctrine of double effect says, if Truman in intentionally did something that was morally permissible and it had predictably harmful consequences, he might not have done anything morally impermissible depending upon all the rest of the circumstances. We have just, uh, Anscombe thinks that she has shown an intention that intentional action is human activity that has the teleological order of practical reasoning, which we just talked about, means end reasoning. So when Truman dropped the bombs, the relevant question is, was the killing of innocent civilians a predictable side effect or was it the means towards the desired end that is making the Japanese surrender? Anscombe thinks it's pretty clear from the way things went that it was the means to the end based, based on um, you know, where the bombs took place and what the, what the objective of, of them was. And so since the, the means itself um, uh, was part of the, this, the, the, the end of killing innocent civilians in order then to bring the, um, uh, bring the war to an end, that means that um, uh, there, um, <clears throat> uh, the action falls under the description of murder precisely because of the structure that it, it involves. Um, the key, this, this brings us back to the notion that we came across earlier when we thought about, are there one intentions, four intentions, uh, a ton of intentions when the pumper is pumping? And Anscombe said, that's the wrong question to ask. Uh, we don't count actions that way. All actions are just actions under the descriptions. If this is the logical structure of what took place, then the description of murder applies. And Anscombe thinks that it's not a good thing for uh, Oxford to be giving honorary degrees to murderers. Okay, um, last slide, and then we'll, we'll turn to Q&A. Um, I put some of the legacy of intention because I think intention has got the, the book itself has got quite a legacy, but here are the parts that I wanna, um, two things I wanna tease out that we've already discussed and one that I would be remiss if I didn't mention, but we didn't have much to say about here. Um, so the first thing I think that's part of uh, intention's legacy is to show just how deeply Cartesianism runs in contemporary philosophy, even after substance dualism is rejected. I think one way of understanding this attack on the psychologistic account of intention with the idea of thinking that in order to explain what intentions are, we start with the contents of a person's mind is that that whole approach is still a holdover from the way that Descartes separated mind from body and then thought that philosophy could take place starting with the mind and then just work its way out to moving the body like a, like a, like a, a, a marionette operates a, a puppet or something like that. Uh, or puppeteer operates a puppet. Um, that's even better if it's a marionette operating puppet. Um, uh, the, 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 to get out of this view, what we need to do is really return to Aristotle and the Aristotelian legacy, which means thinking first, thinking about how um, the way that we think about the world and make decisions about what we do in the world is all part of our activity and action in the world. And that we cannot understand what the mind is up to um, uh, I'm sure both Anscombe and, and, and Aristotle think about this when thinking about belief, but especially in its practical guise, when we're thinking about action and then goodness or badness, rightness or wrongness of action, we can't just start at the mind and then work our way out to the body. The body acting with reason through space has got to be the starting point for thinking of, of any of this stuff. And she makes the case forcefully and intention and, and, and kicks off um, again, a whole new way of doing philosophy of mind and epistemology and ethics that begins to recover um, what she thinks are lost insights from, from Aristotle that have been hiding behind the wake of Descartes for you know, the better part of 300 years. Finally, I didn't say much about this in, this, in, in our discussion here, but she has an entire account of a kind of self-knowledge that she thinks is present in intentional action. It's the kind of self-knowledge that allows you to say when you're doing something, why you're doing it, that she calls non-observational knowledge. Um, so part of her epistemological project is to say that another bad thing that Cartesianism has left us with is the idea that all self-knowledge would be viewing yourself from a third person perspective as if you were viewing the mind of anyone else. And again, I think that this is deeply ingrained in the way that contemporary psychology proceeds and uh, it, it eliminates the very possibility of describing something that is commonplace in our own lives, which is the way that we know what we're doing when we're doing ordinary mundane things and can speak for ourselves about our reasons. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, entire sections devoted to explaining what non-observational knowledge is, which opened up a whole branch of epistemology that's just focused on those limited sections of the text. Uh, and it would take another hour to explain what that's all about. So 
uh, I'll leave it there and I look forward to, um, to your questions.